Morning everyone, welcome along to DigiShift 71, Making Digital Greener. So today we're going to be talking about device reuse and digital inclusion. Um, I'm really excited about this one today. I think there's going to be some really good discussions as well as hearing from some great speakers. We're going to be talking about the environmental challenge of getting hold of more devices and laptops, delivering more digital services and getting more of the people that you work with online. 80% of the lifetime carbon emissions of a smartphone are produced before you unbox it. So adding a few years to the life of the device really reduces impact. And we're going to talk about how can we refurbish, re reuse devices, how can we prolong the life of devices and what does this mean um, for the services that we're delivering as well. We're going to hear from Martina Johnson-Gray and Elaine Brown. They're going to be sharing their experiences of scaling up device reuse in different settings. Martina Johnson-Gray uh, works with Gla uh, Northwest Glasgow Voluntary Sector Network. I will, I will never be able to get the, the, the full name of that correct. Um, and we're going to be hearing also from Elaine Brown, who's Chief Exec at Edinburgh Remakery. So we're going to hear from Elaine first of all. So I'll hand over to you just now, Elaine. I think you don't have any slides. We're just going to jump straight in. Nope, nope. So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to talk about my favourite subject. Uh, I, you know, I could talk about this uh, for the whole hour, but uh, I've got five minutes uh, seemingly to, to, to tell you a little bit about the remakery. Um, so this, this talk is right up our street because this is at the heart of everything that the remakery does. Um, it's really about um, seeing a climate opportunity. Everyone talks about the climate emergency, which there is. But I really see it as a climate opportunity. It's a chance for us to rethink, to, to shift our thinking, to shift our actions. Um, and reuse is the top thing for us. So many people talk about recycling. We don't talk about recycling at the, the remaking. We talk about repair. We talk about reuse. And we do that through our um, e-waste uh, programmes. So at the remakery, uh, we're environmental, uh, social enterprise and charity. And we do different work streams, but today I'll just talk about our e-work. So I joined the Remakery in 2019. Um, we were very small at that time. We had one organisation that donated their end of life tech to us um, and we sold some and that was great. Um, but we really um, ramped that up. We ramped it up during uh, COVID because we could see the need that the digital poverty, the digital isolation that we all was always there was really magnified, wasn't it, during COVID? Um, and we saw an opportunity to really merge those two things hand in hand. So we did that through a variety of messages. So one of the things is we obviously needed to get more people, more businesses to think, how could they get rid of their end of life tech responsibly, ethically, um, with that community benefit as well, that real impact community. So we launched our free tech disposal service for business. So in 2019, going from one business donating their tech, we are now over 200 businesses across Scotland. We are their dedicated e-waste provider for tech. And through that, we are able to reuse. So the end of life for one company is the beginning of a fantastic new life, because what we're trying to get people to see is that tech has a life. You know, it doesn't always have to be about buying that new button, it's pressing new discarding it's about what can you do with something once you're finished with it so we do our magic at the remakery we've got um, a wealth of IT technician hardware technicians and we've got e-waste operatives and that's when we go to work in segregating the parts using those parts to repair um, and then obviously giving that new life either through people buying tech um, at low cost so it's good for your pocket good for the community good for um, the planet but also um, it's about gifting. So um, a big proportion of what we do is that we gift our tech to people who are facing that digital isolation. But the secret ingredient is that they know that they are getting a refurbished bit of tech. And what we're trying to do there is shift the mindset of second hand is not second back best. It is actually the cool thing to have. How wonderful that this gift of tech has been brought back to life and can be used again. So we do that through our tech disposal service for business. We do it through our tech donation boxes, which are doing a journey across Edinburgh to help people, individuals, um, to ethically dispose of their tech and understand the story of what carbon emissions that they're saving, what tonnage diversion, 
but more importantly for a lot of people it's about what good they're doing in the community with their tech. We also do it through our repair cafes so again it's about once people have tech how can they keep it in use longer to prevent them going to that wonderful buy new button. Um, so we do that through our free repair cafes every Friday where people can bring their tech in and watch and that is the key thing we do not want repair to be something magical that happens behind the scenes and then you get something back. We um, say to our clients they must sit with their item and watch it being repaired because some of those repairs they could do themselves. Um, so we do a variety of things, but it's always about planting the seed that repair and reuse of your tech is the way to go. Buying refurbished tech is the way to go. And in doing that together, we can also help tackle digital isolation and digital poverty. So I'm really looking forward to your questions today. Um, I'm sure you're, you're going to um, really challenge me. But again, it's something that I know that you're all interested in and you're all doing uh, your bit. Um, so together, I'm sure we'll, we'll get some fantastic ideas. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Elaine. Right, I'm going to hand over to Martina just now. Um, I just say as well, I've popped uh, links to both Edinburgh Remakery uh, and Northwest Glasgow, Northwest Glasgow Long Sector Network uh, in the chat box as well. So if you want to go and explore a wee bit more, you can go and do that. Thanks, Ross. Can you imagine what it's like when I have to answer the phone and give my full name and the full name of the organisation? People have fallen asleep halfway through it. I'm all that is Martina. So anyway, hi everyone. Uh, how do I follow Elaine? That's amazing. There's some a bit bathtub gin compared to what you do, Elaine. So I'll t I'll say that to people before uh, you all came on. I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you what we actually did. The story sounds really, really nice and neat and it all worked really well. And actually behind the scenes there was a lot. Of, it's a bit like a swan, you know, you're paddling furiously underneath. So our, our story is slightly different. We're a member-led organisation and we support all the third sector charities in the northwest of Glasgow. Northwest of Glasgow seems quite small, but it's actually the same size as Aberdeen, so it's pretty big. And very early in lockdown, our members came to us and said that uh, we're putting our other services online, or all the support services are online, what are we going to do? No one has a device. So I went, oh, okay, I think what I'll do is I'll just start, a, uh, I'll start an IT recycling project. How hard can that be? So, <laughs> So I decided I would put some feelers out and start speaking to people who may be able to help us. We got in touch with one of the local colleges who were uh, recycling, or sorry, refurbishing, as I'll get to refurbishing a bit, because Elaine's right, recycling their towers, the computer towers. I went, oh, how can we get the keyboards and everything else we need on monitors? So I very foolishly just started putting um, you know, bits and pieces out to our members and to local people, and people would just turn up. It was amazing. I had you local people turning up with their wee tablet or their phone or a a, a tower. In some weeks, I was nearly crying because I thought I've only got one, uh, only got one monitor left. What's going to happen now? And it literally was like that. We had no money. We had nothing. I got ten thousand pounds from the lottery and went, "Well, that'll do me for a while." I had a friend who uh, agreed to be our technician for free for a while, and literally. His house was full of bits and pieces of kit and he would just fix it for us and it really came from that. It was a wee tiny acorn and then as we got on we got a bit more money, not much. We also, for us, it was about like with giving people the car, how do we give them the petrol? We want the new internet was incredibly important. I couldn't get anyone to speak to me about that. Eventually, after haranguing every internet and phone provider that we had, EE said they would give us a good deal. So we started getting sims. We bought dongles as well. We just started buying dongles and we had bits of money and gave people a, a year's internet access. So people had that too. It was only 30 gigs a month. We were thinking, how can we support that? What can we do? And um, quite quickly, people just started contacting us. Really, honestly, it all sounds like happenstance. Now, from going from uh, somebody turning up uh, every couple of weeks with a monitor, now we've probably got, a, we've had donations from about 60 businesses. If you Google us in Glasgow, we come up, this, I know Ross, you'll, really, you'll probably hate this, but with absolutely no effort whatsoever, we come up second on Google when you Google for uh, refurbishing in, um, in Glasgow now, just because there's nowhere else doing it in Glasgow. So really and truly, it's all been a bit of all falling into place. What I will say as well, we will take phones, we take tablets, we take towers. We're, we're not very fussy as well, which I think helps. And now businesses know that we can come, we'll go and pick up, we'll clear out their office. And then we'll kind of Frankenstein bits, a bit like what Elaine does at a very small scale. We have one person one day a week 
that does their technician stuff with us. And if we have towers, maybe we'll make three computers out of five towers, you know, and stuff like that as well. We just repair as much as we can. We only ever, ever, ever get rid of something if we can. We've done everything, stripped it of everything. We never, we, you know, our first mate is what can we do to repair this? What can we do to fix this to make sure it's, um, it's of use? So from probably May this year, we, we donated a thousand computers to recipients in the northwest of Glasgow. Doesn't sound like a lot, but again, we have no funding, we have no support from anybody else as well. So you know, it's been it's been like primarily primarily computers, but some laptops and phones as well. I mean, we have situations where our members come and say, "Fuel vouchers are now text to our clients. We have no phones." So we go and go and try and get some phones for somewhere, fix them up and give them back out again. It really is about meeting the recipient need. All our, um, and to make sure that the recipients get support, we are kind of like we have the middle person idea. So what we do is we have a referral process. So our, our members and friends of our network will come and refer a, a recipient and they have to do the, the ongoing support. We know that giving somebody a computer or a laptop or a phone isn't enough. Giving them internet isn't enough. What we need to do is make sure they've got ongoing support. We don't have the capacity. There's three part-time staff in here and one in our, our technician one day a week. So what we do is make sure that that referrer is that ongoing support for them as well. It's interesting because now um, we have referrals from all over the city. We try to help if we can. Really, we're really funded. Well, we're getting funded, but our funding is from the northwest. There's a huge need out there, and it's interesting because Elaine obviously comes from because we make it. That's they come from the kind of the, the, the eco and the green part of it. And we actually started looking into that later on. I'll be honest, but you know, the UK is one of the top ten polluters, uh, e polluters in the world. You know, we know that uh, refurbishing devices and reusing them is the way to go. So now when we speak to businesses and stuff like that and organisations, we do we do make sure that they know that as well. So from um, your wee man down the road in Yoker, giving us a wee laptop that we preciously coiled on to and going, do you want that? Now we would say we probably get offered donations twice a week from large organisations who want to drop off 30 laptops, I don't know, 20 towers, eh, whatever we can get. We could clear out offices every day of the week if we had more money and more time. So, But for us, it really is about the digital divide. We know there's people out there. I think what um, is interesting, I think some of the powers that we would say that digital exclusion and the digital divide only happened during COVID, all it did is shine a light on it. We know that uh, people in poverty are um, excluded from so much because they don't have access to device and internet. What I will say now, our members are telling us, because we get, we're the member led, all the intelligence and all what we know comes from our members. We know now that people that did have broadband are. Uh, are disconnecting and are having to disconnect from it because they can't afford it. We also know people are reducing the data on their phones as well. So what I would say is part of the solution is definitely uh, we give data dongles. We've been very lucky when they get donations of SIMs and we just pay for the dongles now. We just don't have money for contracts for, uh, for SIMs at the minute. But what I will say is really looking into how we connect people. It's that, those three things, the device, internet, and then support and how to use it are huge. We can't, we simply don't have the capacity for support how to use it. So what we do is rely on our referrers to do that bit too, which is hugely important. So um, we're in the position now where we're, we're continuing what we're doing. We have on a shoestring and we will continue to do it too. And what's great about it is we're those kind of that trusted place that we can go. And now to sum up, because I think this is really important, it sounds like we just all went, oh, that's what we do. We made sure we had a process to wipe the to wipe the devices that works. We have a process that works. You need that. You need to have a process and to be able to provide a data destroyer certificate for the people that are donating so they know that all the device because that's one of the things that people worry about having their game their data in some way you know that the data is not safe make sure you have that for me a referral process make sure that you know who the referrers are so you've got that middle person that'll do the support and also i think internet is hugely important if for us anyway as people that work with third sector organizations work with people who are vulnerable i think giving them access to internet or a way that they can get access to internet is important too and i'm just checking the notes because i probably actually not said anything i was going and I think that um, getting a, a regular donation 
uh, supply is hugely important too. That's really important. So I think that being build up that trust and build up that reputation in your community, whatever your community is, whether it's Glasgow, whether it's the Northwest or whatever. Yeah. So people know that when they send stuff to you, that it's safe and it has got a new life too. So even giving people stories and case studies about their things go. We never do the big uh, picture of, oh, this is a recipient, aren't they lucky to have the computer? We don't do that. But what we do is have some case studies so people know that an Assam seeker, a refugee, and a person with a mental health issue, or a family of five with a, um, you know, that need their homework done are able to um, now do the homework because they have this device that they have. Right. Oh, you just muted yourself, Martina. Sorry, I've just, uh, sorry, I know I did because somebody came in. Sorry, apologies. No, so, yeah, I guess it's been all over the place, but what I'll do is I'm quite happy to take questions. Again, it's a bit bathtub gin compared to Elaine, but it seems to be working so far. <laughs> So, yeah, I'll look forward to your questions if you have any. Stop underselling yourself. That's going to be my first thing because, like, the work that you're doing is amazing. And the fact that people are coming to you at that kind of level says something about the work that you're doing as well. So, yeah, I think that's that's a, a critical part. I was actually one of the things I was going to quickly talk about, and I think we can, we can probably move beyond this quite quickly, but, like, how much do you both feel the kind of public face and perception of reuse is critical. So not just like what's the environmental impact, but actually what what is that public perception and that feeling around reuse? Because you mentioned Elaine about like trying to make reuse cool and like what what is what is the, what is the kind of nuance of that and what, what do we need to do in terms of that space? Yeah. Um at the remakery, uh, we don't care which pinch point people come to us for. So if they come to us purely because you know they've got low income and they, they, they want to buy a, a great bit of kit that's lower cost and um, then that's brilliant because they'll come in they will see repair in action all around them and it's that osmosis effect um some people come to us because the environment is absolutely you know their, their thing and and um they, they maybe thought recycling was the thing and obviously then they come realize and repair so that's great um, and others come because they just want to have an absolutely great time. You know, they want to come and, and um, sit at our cafes and get something repaired and have a chat. So whatever way that they come at us, because our messaging is there, it's not ramming it down their throat, but it's, it's there. Um, they see they see repair. That is the, the key thing. If you see it, you can be it. Um, and I'm very passionate about it. it should be on our high street. It shouldn't be. I lost count of the amount of times people said, oh, just get a warehouse and be away out in industrial estate and do what you do. No, I want to be on the high street. I think it's very, very important that we reimagine our high streets and repair and reuse and social enterprise um, and all the wonderful things that we all do should be visible because if people in the public see it, so it's part of our community, then that's how it will happen. And if you hide it away, um, that's not the secret. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Ross. Um, I think, I mean, yeah, because I, I think my point, my point was like, how how do we get to a point where reuse like it's universal and it's for everyone that it doesn't feel like we're doing this for specific groups, but actually everyone feels... Get it on the high street. You, you know, our <laughs> high streets are dying. Let's put in these things so that people, um, there's no stigma to it. It's, it's the, the default setting is that you should be getting things repaired. And the, the key thing is a lot of people don't do it because it's difficult. They don't know yeah. how to do it. If you make things simple for people, they will do the right thing. Martina, I think, yeah, yeah, I think for me, the bit about uh, you and Shiny, I have to say, I'll probably annoy lots of people here. I think the um, the, the Scottish government's uh, giving away all these Chromebooks was an absolute nightmare for me because I was doing great and everyone wanted their computers and all of a sudden, like, oh no, I heard you can get a free Chromebook and I was nearly weeping because I'm like, these are all going to be doorstops in two years because you kind of do it with them after a certain point. So that's just a personal thing. What I will say for us, we make sure that our computer packages look I mean, everything's free. We don't, you know, everything's free at point of source. It's all always going to be free for us because that, that's just how we do it because it's the spawn that the member needs. Our packages have to look attractive. We make up a really nice box and we make it look like a really attractive thing that someone's getting. So it's not a really old scabby carrier bag. It's like a really nice storage box. It's got everything in it. It's got a really nice how-to guide and it looks like something really positive someone's getting. If they get a laptop, they get it in a laptop bag. If they get a phone, they get it really nicely presented. Because, yeah, particularly for people in poverty, people in poverty don't have choice the way we do. 
So I think some people in poverty actually think, well, actually, I really want something new. Not always, but sometimes they do. And there is actually sometimes more of a stigma around second hand for people that are experiencing poverty because of they, they don't have the choice. So now I think it's been great, the school uniform drive and all the different things about people are, are reusing now across the board. But I do think it's really important that when we're giving something to someone for free, that it doesn't look like it's a, a kind of, well, you can't afford anything else. I think how we present it to people and what we the, the message that we give to people about actually this has been it's a really fantastic computer it's been repaired it was here and now we're giving it to you because it's got a second life so i think that how you present it to people and the um, the story around about it has to be very positive too because i think that's important because it's all right for us middle class folk saying oh it's great having something new, uh, recycled or reused but for people in poverty who don't have a choice for anything, it can seem something else, or oh, that's just something I can't afford. So how we present it and how we package it is hugely important, I think. Yeah, thanks, Martina. Yeah, John, anything standing out in the chat for um, you in terms of questions or points? So I'm just skipping up the chat, but um, one thing I was thinking about, well, Dave's got a really good question. It's a wee way back about sometimes when people say something's broken, it's maybe an issue with understanding how to use it. And I guess that speaks to your point you're making um, about you just take everything. You're not sitting there saying something because that enables you, I guess, to get devices that are actually still functional. Dave, did you want to say anything more about that? Or have I paraphrased you correctly? Yeah, I think um, I was trying to avoid the cardinal sin of, of making a comment rather than a question, which yep. <laughs> we don't um, mind. <laughs> but yeah, I think sometimes when... In, in my experience when somebody brings something and says that you know I don't want this or I don't need this sometimes there's quite a lot beneath there about like I don't have the confidence to use it or I'm not interested in using it in in some kind of more fundamental way so I think there's maybe a, a good opportunity to challenge that and to, to use the maybe the passion of a digital champion to try and draw out the hook that might get somebody using something when you know maybe just to challenge the fact that it's not needed or wanted it could actually be needed or wanted if that yeah. person is engaged in the right way. Yeah, so in a way that's like you could give support and that might mean it's being used again, but it's actually changing ownership. It's just about support to make sure it is used well. Yeah, and, and also I think sometimes this is broken isn't always this is broken. It's I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I think our repair cafes show us that a lot of times. People come in and they're sort of like, I don't think this works anymore or, oh, it's something sort of glitching. We don't help with software. We are not, we are hardware repair. Um but often it's just something very simple that could be fixed, but that's the thing that's just stopped them using it, you know, a faulty keyboard, just a faulty connection or what have you. Um, and suddenly they walk out with something that is reusable again. Um, so there's an element of that. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say someone's made a really good point on um on the chat about um, operating systems and stuff as well. Obviously, we don't yeah. have a Microsoft license. We will never have one because we just don't have the money and it, well, it's a big, long, slow process and people would have to update at some point. So we use uh, Zorin, which is obviously an open source thing as well. Hannah, we've worked with Hannah a lot. It's been great working with Glasgow Disability Alliance and we've given the computers that we, you know, that we can and we have and laptops and stuff. For some users, it's a bit scary. If you haven't, if you've used Microsoft a lot and you think, oh, what you're putting on that. So we do have this really comprehensive how to guide as well. We try and walk people through it. It's a bit different. It can be scary because it's an office package. It's different. It doesn't look hugely different, I have to say. But for someone who's new to using computers, which some people that we work with are, um, then it doesn't matter. But for others, it does. I mean, and Hannah is saying that they purchase uh, Microsoft and Windows and stuff like that. And that's fine. What we say is we've given you this. Again, it's great because we have these referrers. If they have got the money to purchase something else and put, you know, that on, that's great. But we also say this is free. Please try and use it. And actually, when we had a wee bit of COVID recovery money and those things existed, we put on a wee course. And what it was, it was like the kind of Rolls well, Royce, like the Tesla now. Who says Rolls The Tesla of what we want to do, where we had a, a we'd give people the computers were there and they would learn on the computer they were going to take home. And they would go through all using this new operating system and this new uh, office package and stuff. And then they would do that for six weeks and then we'd take it home with them, getting lunch and do the other things that we did as well. And that worked well. So what we do now is just make sure that the feathers know 
what to expect so they can support them too because people go oh that's not what I'm used to when I was in the library I didn't use that or when I was in my uh, that, that IT suite I didn't use that so there's that bit of it as well and we know and Ross I'm sure you probably have a thought this as well we want to use open source if we can for so many reasons you know so but it is that thing too that you've got to be careful people don't get put off by something different oh this is a refurbed computer it's not got what I'm used to on it so you've got to think of all those things too so we are dead open from the very beginning the many times I've talked about open source and about office packages and stuff but I knew nothing about it is amazing but you've got to just be dead clear and that again having the deferrer be part of that process is really important for us because it means they can have that ongoing support. In fact, one of the things we're going to start doing now, which we've never had capacity to do before, we're going to actually have a, a kind of session for the ferrers where they say, right, this is exactly what's happening. If there's a troubleshooting thing, this is exactly what you can do about it. This is what open source means. This is what the office package is. So again, they can even get more knowledge of what we're expecting from them because we just simply don't have the capacity to do that bit. So we have to make sure that the people that are working directly with the recipients have so I have had people phone me up and go, hey, I can't get this computer switched on, what do you do? And I just talk them through it, you know, like I'm an expert, which clearly I'm not. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, I think I mean there's yeah, the, the I, I used to be quite a diehard Chromebook user and that kind of built-in obsolescence is a massive turn off. And I don't know, I know the EU's making quite a lot of shifts and it's maybe something we can cover in terms of, you know, devices being able to be more reused and updated and battery changes and all sorts of things. And I don't know if that'll mean that Chromebooks have changed or maybe they have changed since I've switched uh, back to using Windows. But I think that is a huge issue for a lot of people that, you know, you end up with, as you said, Martina, a doorstop um, yeah, or or you use something that has massive security holes in it because you can keep using it, but it's not going to get the updates. So. Um, I don't know, does anyone want to come in on that? Because I'm conscious that Chromebooks were a kind of core part of a lot of the digital inclusion drive in Scotland. Anyone got any feelings or thoughts on that? We have a, we, I've worked for VTO, which is the, the volunteer tutors organisation. Um, so we work with a lot of young people um, who either were donated Chromebooks or we give them Chromebooks um, for the duration of their tutoring. Um, one of the issues that we found is that they're, sort of made deliberately quite difficult to reset and reuse um it feels that way anyway um and so yeah we have we haven't purchased any new uh chromebooks since the first kind of batch that we got um one of the things that we tend to run up against when donating devices with the intention of getting them back is that um we often have to do resets for the device to then Send it out again if that makes sense uh, and so that's something we've kind of had to learn how to do ourselves uh, on the fly um, so yeah it's, it's a challenge mm -hmm. thanks Liz. anyone else want to come in I do, we're going to go down a chromebook rabbit hole here potentially um, but, uh, john do you want to come in i've got something which isn't chromebook related i've actually got two questions sorry i'm thinking of loads but um so one is i was hearing a point um i think it was martina about companies, organizations not understanding that there needs to be some funding and support to enable the work to happen. So I guess is that perception of, oh, we're giving somebody 20 devices and they should be able to magically recondition them for free. So that's obviously a, a pretty problematic narrative. And I wondered if you'd had any success in challenging that. And the other one was about like e-waste so presumably it's maybe a very small amount but you maybe do get a little pile of stuff that is just not fixable and how that gets dealt with because presumably that becomes a cost for you in terms of it's got to go somewhere eventually so those two quick questions sorry for hogging the um questions but yeah Elaine, i've been speaking a lot do you want to go for it and then i'll do it afterwards so we'll take the second question uh, around um, e-waste. Uh, so yes, we, we will get some things that uh, are not refurbishable, whatever. So we have uh, e-waste technicians who segregate all the parts and parts that will then be used to refurbish. Um, but we do have lots of motherboards and things like that that, um, you know, are piles of that. Um, so we um, are always sort of creative about how we go about that because we do not want to um, 
recycle. We do not want to put things to, to waste. So uh, we now have a partnership with the Royal Mint um, and they take our uh, motherboards and things that we um, can't use because they extricate the, the precious metals in that. Um, so that has been really fantastic for us. So huge amount of our stuff that you know, is of no value to us um, in, in terms of refurbishing then goes to get a new life because all the valuable metals, because that's why we do it in the environmental sense, because we know that e-waste is hugely damaging to the environment if it gets into our uh, water streams, if it gets into our soil, but also it is finite materials, it is precious materials that are not gonna be there forever. And if we just discard them unethically, um, then there's going to come a point where we go, oh, we don't have that stuff anymore. So we want to make sure that all that stuff is used and reused. Um, so our partnership with the Royal Mint has been absolutely fantastic um, because that, that stuff that we can't use, it's actually going to an, another source. Um, and then we also use a lot of our parts to um, train young people so that they understand what's in their computer and they're often amazed. It, it's amazing. Uh, some people call it it's like city in your in your computer because you know it's full of magical stuff. Uh, and I'm forgetting your your first question. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, it was about um, when an organisation is making a donation, they might imagine, well, look at this. We're giving you lots of devices, and they forget that there's costs and time involved in making those fit for purpose for the new users. Yeah. Um, so for us, we made our tech disposal service for business free because we wanted those uh, the tech. Um, but you're right. Um, it doesn't all magically happen. We we have paid staff. Um, we pay the, the living wage or beyond. Um, so, yes. But once we've got the partnerships with the, the key thing is once we've got the partnerships with the businesses that are donating and they see the great things that happen, then they ask after that. Is, it's not simple, but it's easier because we build up a partnership, we build up a relationship. Um, but that is hard, you know, it's part of the process. It doesn't happen magically. So, yes, we often get people think, oh, we've done our bit. We've given you all our stuff. Go to it. It is harder than that. Um, so a big part for social enterprise and charity is that we spend huge amount of time nurturing those partnerships to, to sort of explain to them that the magic happens if we work together. Yeah, for us, obviously we're, yeah, because we, we're doing everything for free. People think they're doing you a favor giving you stuff as well. Yeah, John, and it's not like that. So, because basically we're sometimes it's office claims almost we're doing. So yeah, it's hard to have those kind of conversations at the minute, you know, where like they're just going, well, you're giving me a computer, it's going to be a second life as magic. We've had a couple of organizations have said, right, well, we'll pay for this or we'll pay for that because we know what you're doing, particularly because they understand, not not much, but a couple that said, well, we'll pay for this bit or we'll do that bit because they understand that we're, you know, that how, how precarious our situation is because we don't have a great deal of money. And it's interesting how people were chucking money at you during the uh, lockdown. Now it's a bit like hmm, that bit's a bit you know and that isn't our core work either so probably you know it is a bit like this is just a wee tiny thing that seems to have got bigger and bigger and bigger and taken over other bits of my life so yeah th there isn't a magic solution to it but I do think that the club somebody was saying corporate social responsibility yeah, it's interesting I've got a real I've got a thing that I, I preach about a lot funnily enough anyone who knows me knows I'm a wee bit preachy it's quite annoying I think that anyone obviously I can all talk for Glasgow I think anyone that's on Glasgow City Council soil should have a responsibility to refurb at least a protect of the computers. I think uh, businesses and academic institutions should be forced to do that. Maybe forced is a very, very strong word, but I do think they should. You hear horror stories of things going into uh, just any skips and all that. Obviously, the hard drives taken out to be things any skips and all these things about different things over the years that your friends tell you who work for academic institutions or other things that you hear. So I do think there's that bit of it. And that's the way that answers someone's question, really. But I do think that we have a responsibility. I think uh, the powers that be, decision makers, Scottish government councils should be uh, much more um, direct in what they're saying to the businesses that are on their soil and their academic institutions that are on their soil in terms of what they expect in terms of uh, re reusing um, the tech, because it's hugely important because there's a huge amount of citizens out there that desperately need it. 
and there's a huge amount of waste out there, but they would rather scrap it than go through the process of digitally wiping it because they don't feel that their their stuff safe. And we've had stuff with children's charities and everything, you know, which obviously everyone's uh, data is incredibly important, but even more so if you're a children's charity, because we get donations with charities all the time, and clearly their data is hugely important. And we make sure that it's ethically wiped and it's digitally wiped at an industry standard and we produce certificates to make sure it's wiped as well. So there is no reason. I think that's one of the things, and I'd probably Ross, what you'd said already, maybe I didn't emphasise it enough. What are the what are the ways to make this one of the things we get asked all the time is about the digital wiping one of the things we need to get out there is you can wipe safely and you can make sure that you, people can't get their data back you can do that that's one of the main things that we would say it's it's easy to wipe something to make sure that it's safe because i think that's what businesses and charities are always worried about so we need to get that message out there it's not just about the the i think the eco thing is hugely important clearly it is but one of the things people worried about is their data so we have to get that message out there that you can wipe and it's safe and nothing's going to happen to your data because I think that's the thing people are most worried about. They'll get sued because some of the data will turn up somewhere at some point. And that probably was a bit of a tangent, but it's important, I think, we need to get that out there. Yeah, I would echo that. I think there was some question further up what had been the biggest barrier to businesses. And the biggest barrier was, um, well, it was two things. One, they just didn't know what to do with it. So stuff it in a cupboard and worry about it for another day. Um, and the second one was around data. Um, so at the Edinburgh Remakery, we are SEPA registered, we are data wipe registered, and we are an ISO 27001 accredited organisation, which is the highest international standard for um, uh, data security. Um, and we've done all that to... Uh, to take away that fear because yeah we are living in an age where people's data is um, hugely hugely important and um, your life is sometimes in these devices isn't it and um, so so yeah so taking that barrier away and and it's back to what I said before if you make things simple for people they will do it it's just that the system you know as uh, Martina said you know it's um, organizations not understanding there's no there's no systems in place. There's no legislation that's really driving that on. So people just don't know what to do. But if you make something simple and then people can see the benefit, those two things together work well. Um, and, you know, it's the carrot and the stick kind of thing. Legislation will have to come in. I totally agree, you know, to drive it down. But I think when people see from grassroots how many things that we can do together that are wonderful, that also works as well. So it's just getting that balance right. Thanks very much. Um, we've got a question from Gozi that's a bit related about is there some CSR leverage so that um, tech companies can see it as more of their responsibility and I wondered if that was an angle that you're looking at or thinking about. Us, not not our low level, I have to say, but sometimes it gets very frustrating when you can't, when you get Apple products in it, then you're like that. Uh. <laughs> we don't have we've got one actually do you know I, I need to tell you this we have when um last year i've put an advert out for a tech guy and i got a 17 year old who was still at school that right? he was going to start doing computing at st andrews after the holidays and i thought i can't just take a chance this guy this guy is a genius he's come back now he's been at st andrews for a year and he has revolutionized what we've done Right. And that's literally, we had a 17 year old we were paying £15 an hour who thought all his Christmas would come at once because he was 17 and he was getting £15 quid an hour. And now he's come back and he's saying he's coming back during his, his Christmas holidays for um, for uh, for four weeks. But literally, you know, it's incredible because we took a chance. And that sounds as if we've got some wee shonky guys who know what he's doing, but this guy's a complete genius and we took a chance on him. And now we're able to, you know, and that's the thing about it as well. You know, obviously we don't have the, the power that, and the, you know, that Elaine's got, which sounds amazing. But it is that interesting thing as well. You just have to get someone good and take a chance on them as well and know that they're good. And before that, we had a friend who did stuff for year, like years without getting paid. And we paid him eventually. It sounds like slavery, but it wasn't honestly. He did want to do it. Um, and so it is about, you know, that kind of thing, just taking chance of people that we know that can do something. Somebody stop, sorry, I'm going to shut up because somebody's got some stuff in the chat. Go see, go for it, you got a hand. Are you going to come in there, Gozi? Sorry, sorry, yes, yes, thanks. Um, no, uh, just to say, yeah, thanks for um, for today. And I, I think that's part of my question about 
corporate social responsibility was kind of answered a bit to some extent from Martina. It's like leverage, I use the word loosely, but essentially, you know, um, that, it was just jogged by that, you know, sort of comment with regards to the relationship with the, the Royal Mints. Um, you know, I'd like to think that there was, you know, a, a financial element that sort of came the makeries way with, with regards to that, but I'd like to think that surely that there would be like a, a number of kind of drivers um, a, a variety of, of levels at local, national or global that could be sort of actually enharnessed to drive this whole concept of what will, you know, reuse, refurbish, um, you know, generate income and make that viable for those who need it the most. Because otherwise I struggle to kind of see how we really get to the crux of inclusion um, of actual real, real inclusion for some of the groups that, that we're talking about. Um, because we need to be able to cast that night, that 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 net really wide. And I think the work that both of these are doing is amazing. Um, but it, it it can't survive alone in clusters. It'd be brilliant to see it just sort of evolve and, and span out and make big tech a little bit more responsible. Anyway, thanks. I I agree um, absolutely. And I think um there's also a role um, there. I'm quite passionate about procurement um, and the, the role that that plays as well, because that sort of drives it because they have to do it because if they're going to get a tender, they're going to have to, to link in. So I'm really, really passionate about um, procurement and supply chains um, around that. Uh, and we have done that with a couple of organisations. We've become their sort of supply chain for social value. Uh, and I don't see it as being the poor relation. I feel that we really are a crucial component um, for, for their tender opportunities um, because social value um, has it, it gets greater points now. You know, it's about 10, 10%, but now it's going up to about 20%. And they don't know how to do that. And our type of organisation absolutely can provide that and that's where we get the leverage because that's where we get some money that's where we get them buying into us our uh, partnerships with some of the organizations that we are there the social value we can ask for lots of things from that so we can um you know to help in that social inclusion so one of our um to give you an example one of our um, we are a, a provide the social value for an organisation as part of their peripherals, IT peripherals contract with the Scottish Government. Um, and through that, we've asked them for volunteering. We've asked them to, to donate, to sponsor one of our tech boxes. We can ask lots of things and then that helps us to then help the community. Um, but again, my bugbear is that that is not simple. You know, and I think that the, the Scottish government, I've just sat on a panel a couple of weeks ago just about this um, for the Scottish government to say they need to make it simpler for us. Because just as I was saying before, if you make things simple, people will do it for a big part of like our organisations to get on that procurement list is so, so difficult. They need to make that simpler and repair and reuse should be part of that and embedded into people's contracts. But it can't be a mountain that we have to climb. It's, it should be something that is open to us, easy for us to do, because together we're, we're adding value. Um, but I'm on to a different subject. <laughs> I'm on to procurement now rather than uh, digital inclusion. <laughs> I want to be a lane when I grow up. But yeah, totally. But yeah, I think it's so true. Even just from a council level, I think like, you know, a local authority level where we are, I think there should be much more emphasis on the a pressure put on, maybe that keeps saying pressure, and an active encouragement to look at refurbishment and at least a percentage of all the devices to be uh, refurbished, uh, phones, tablets, laptops, towers, everything, and that they should be working in partnership with people like ourselves, funnily enough. Because it's all, I mean, you know, I'm going to be learning this, it's going to be on YouTube as well. But, you know, being part of a council digital strategy is different from getting some uh, support for it, you know, and, it, and I think that they're very different things. So I do oh. think that there needs to be, yeah, an acknowledgement, not just in local authority that I'm in, but just in all those local authorities to to make sure that they understand that refurb is the way forward and that, they, they know, that 
there needs to be a response, you know, a response to that. There can't just be like, well, that's smash, and that's just something that happens over there. It has to be at their core rather than just a periphery and thing that they do because it's quite a nice wee thing to do and it ticks a box. We're not things aren't going to get any easier in terms of the environment. It's not going to get any better. It's just getting worse. So even if it's only a small part that we can do, but also it does tick another box in terms of there's people, there's citizens in their communities that just cannot access the internet and cannot access a device. So we have that there's a there's a way forward for it, there's a place for it. It just needs to be properly resourced and also I think the legislation is probably quite important. See, I'm one of the carrot above of the stick and you're more the carrot I mean, like that's what it is. I'll just be the stick now. <laughs> What, what, a, what a team. I was going to ask a very, very quick question. I think we've probably got time for another couple of questions, but do you have any, is there a strategic approach to the companies? I'm just conscious, like some companies are initially purchasing much, much higher end computers. So if you're a tech firm or design firm, you, you're starting off with pretty high end kit already. Whereas if you're a local authority, you're probably hanging on to stuff over a longer term and you're probably purchasing fairly kind of grey box standard kit. Do you have a strategic approach that actually if we can go and reach that organisation that has the higher end stuff, we can get more value out of it at the other end? Or does it just happen to be kind of who comes to you at any given moment? It'd just be interesting to hear what that kind of looks like. I believe that would definitely be your first. Okay. Um, at the beginning, um, because I was trying to get more organisations, um, our strategy was get to organisation or businesses across Scotland, got tech and, and we'll, we'll take everything. Um, it's interesting. So we're just coming to the end of our three year business strategy this year. So we are now planning for our next three years. And what we're doing is we're much more streamlining that now because we've created a monster. Um, so um, we um, do have a strategy now where we are targeting um, and coveting um, the partners that got the, the more high end stuff. Um, and it partly is, it, it's as uh, Marina was say, uh, Martina was saying that um, when we're gifting, we want to gift really high quality refurbished stuff because it's not about the stigma and it's about you are, you are valued, this item is valued and you as an individual are valued. Um, and it's also part of our social enterprise uh, strategy as well, because obviously we sell refurbished tech and we're getting a demand for, you know, items that people can um, deal with in the, in the modern world. And um, that's not to say that we don't work with our other organisations, but we're kind of streamlining it. So if that answers your question at the beginning, it was like, get businesses all engaging with us. And now, now that we've got them, we're sort of putting them into compartments and really looking at that sort of high end stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so for us, as you can imagine, <laughs> because there's is just some wee small thing we did and do take anything and it, that had its issues. So now if well, if and when we get a bit more funding, what we're doing is we're looking at, we've got a kind of standard now of like, we will take this, this and this. It's generally a bit age really a lot of time for us as well. Yeah. And also if we get something stonkingly fantastic and we, you know, we, we want to get as many people as possible digitally included. If there's something stonkingly fantastic and it's something that can be used for music or for design and stuff like that, then what if somebody comes in and says, well, actually I'm going to be doing this and I'm doing that. And sometimes we get requests like that from, you know, the city fair says that a paint wants to start doing music and stuff paint wants to start doing well, design or something then we've got something there but generally everything's all that, we don't put anything out that isn't of a standard but you know we've got a quality standard for that but we take stuff and you know and I think now what we are going to be looking at rather than saying it's a standard we have a list of requirements what things we'll take and things we will but generally because um, at the beginning of lockdown some people were just separate for diseases we just you know but it has caused like exactly what Elaine says it, it do create a monster I mean you should see I wouldn't even show you the room that we have but it's just yeah, it's not like Elaine it's not like you know, it's just a room that's full of stuff and every so often it gets all tidied up and where our technician Joel goes they have tidied all that up and then we get 15,000 more donations of stuff and we're like <laughs> So yeah, at one point my house was full, the cupboards were full, everything was bursting. It's not as bad as that now, but it is like, yeah, we're just so passionate about making sure that everyone, every citizen that needs it, gets a device, gets an internet, gets the support to use it. That's where we are with this. It, it's not the answer to uh, people's uh, poverty, but it's certainly, a, it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. It gives them access to information, access to supports, access to even just leisure stuff that they didn't have before. Because at the end of the day, we're doing this because we passionately believe the citizens of Glasgow have rights to everything. 
you know, and what I will say, and I'm not going to get into this in great detail because I'll just rant, we looked at um, having a kind of a sort of internet, sort of community internet provider thing. We still want to do it. That's my, before I die, I'm definitely doing this. This will be on my gravestone. She did this because we'd like to be a broadband provider and do a community broadband provider because we think that's a definite what's missing. We know that um, people, that, in lots of uh, countries, digital and having broadband is a digital right. It's a human right. And then it's our constitutions. And I think that's hugely important. I mean, there's some community centres just because they don't have it, don't have Wi-Fi. There's lots of places that don't have Wi-Fi. You know, you hear people are people sat now a community centre at nine o'clock at night using their Wi-Fi. So there are ways to do it. So I think that's enough. But I probably did you shift for another time. But I do think that I'm passionate about the fact that giving somebody a dongle and six months internet access isn't enough. What we need to make sure is that everybody has access to good quality internet as well. So probably going off on a tangent, but I do think there's definite need for a community a broadband provider that provides free or extremely low cost broadband that continues to do that in our communities because we're, we're, we're selling people short. We really are. I can't at all conscious give out a device to anyone without knowing that they've either got access to the internet or that we actually um, give them at least six months internet access with a view that the referrer will be able to support that in a longer term if we can't. So yeah, as I say for another time, but yeah, there needs to be a look at how we're giving uh, people, you know, not just a device, but access to good quality broadband that means yeah. they can be part of the community i know yeah brilliant thanks martina uh, john any final thoughts for you there's loads of plus ones that um, did you, did you yeah so broadband? on that one i think that did you, broadband for all would be a fantastic topic so I'd maybe ask you the room who would be good speakers on that topic i mean martina's obviously got off to a fantastic flying start there but what i'm thinking of as well is maybe if there are people in places or networks that maybe need to hear that conversation who might be good people to approach because I think it is a really key issue and I guess maybe the the feeling I'm leaving the digital shift with is like think about digital in this very holistic way so not just about using a device at one moment in one setting but what are the social environmental impacts and there's so much there in terms of what Elaine and Martina have said about organizations doing small things to make things much more sustainable and that's a really important thing to do so really glad to hear of all the work you're doing and really inspired by it as well very many messages ago in the chat um ross shared links to your website so if you're interested in what we've talked about today you can connect with martina and elaine and their work um either on the using devices side or donating devices side as well so thank you so much for the time and the really interesting discussion um, Okay, um, there's some useful messages on broadband going into chat, so we'll keep an eye on them. Safe. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's been great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. That's brilliant. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, you know, anyone's got a few thousand pounds in their back pocket they want to give to her. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm preaching they converted here. Nobody's got any money, but yeah, yeah. What I will say very lastly, we started half a project on community broadband. It's called VG. So, we actually have a fully formed thing. I just don't have any money to take it any further. So, there is there is hope for community broadband. I got in touch with some really, really clever people that actually know how to do it. It's just we need the money to do it. So, yeah, it will happen at one point, as I say before. When I win the lottery, that's what I'm going to do with my lottery winnings. Make community broadband how sad is my life. <laughs> Brilliant. So you're gonna have one giant Wi-Fi box in Glasgow, it'll be Martina's Wi-Fi. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't that be terrifying, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. This a wee plug, we'll be back in September. The focus is going to be on online fundraising. We're going to be talking about small charities and big impact. So uh, that will go live on the SCBO website soon-ish, hopefully. So hopefully see you all there. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks very much. Everyone. Nice to meet everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.